uh, turning up. I know I sent out the invitations, I think, a bit last minute. Um, unfortunately, last week I was blind with um, tooth pain and actually forgot to send the email out until this morning. But it's great. We've got 20 attendees in already. So thank you, everyone, for actually coming along. And we'll get started with a bit of a chat. What we're going to do first is um, if you've got any questions, pop it into the Q&A box. The chat box, we're going to leave for... Um, any links that Margaret, Kathy, or I will want to put in there for you so that you can click on them and you'll get more information on the Glasgow University webpage. So like I said, keep any questions to the Q&A box that you've got. Um, so what we'll do is I will just introduce both of you and then you can just say a little bit about what you do, what programme obviously it is that you're the director of, as everyone will know anyway, um, a bit more about your background as well uh, and um, what sort of research that you, you do or have done in the past to get you who you are. So, um, Doctor, oh, is it Professor Cathy Johnman or is it Dr Cathy Johnman? It's Doctor. Doctor, okay. So if you'd like to um, just say a little bit about yourself then, let's just get started. Yes, no problem. My name's Cathy Johnman. I'm a clinical senior lecturer in public health. I'm the current um, MPH programme director. Um, my background is in clinical medicine. I trained as a consultant in public health and during my training took uh, some time out to do um, a research, did a PhD looking at uh, chronological and biological ageing in coronary heart disease. Um, and I am also an honorary consultant in public health who has been pretty much uh, full on actively involved in the public health COVID-19 response uh, with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, uh, which is the local health board or the local health organisation um, that probably the majority of students that come to the University of Glasgow um, will be part of. I'm uh, only the programme director uh, for the next uh, month or so, uh, and then a colleague will take over. I am moving to full-time NHS to continue the COVID-19 work. Oh, well, well, congratulations and good luck, uh, Cathy. Thank you. Okay, so Margaret, yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Margaret Ashton, and I'm the administrator for the Master of Public Health programme have been for many years. Um, so basically my job is any administration to do with the programme and also to look after the students during the course of their study, whether that's one year if you're a full-time study or two or three years if you're a, a part-time student. Um, so anything you have, you want to know about the programme, about studying at Glasgow, about the regulations, anything like that will all come through me. Excellent. Okay, so just to get the ball rolling then, because we've not got any open questions in the Q&A box just yet, um, we can just get started with a few sort of general questions um, that have come in, the sort of cross-programme questions that apply to, to quite a lot um, of the, the programmes that we've got. So, um, Cathy, what can students expect in their first semester? So in the First semester in the MPH programme, um, students will undertake their uh, core courses and the core courses uh, are made up of principles in public health, introduction to statistics, introduction to epidemiology, and they'll do a um, non-credit research methods course. So that's the first thing in terms of academic courses. What else? Well, they'll be assigned um, an advisor uh, who will be able to support them in their journey through the MPH. Um, and they'll meet with that advisor and undertake something called an initial program essay. And this was something that we developed in the program um, because we are aware that um, we have a really multi-disciplined, multi-diverse group that come to do the MPH. 
at the University of Glasgow and some will have had a lot of experience uh, doing academic essays, while others it may have been a long time ago that that experience was. Um, and for others, it may be that they've only ever uh, undertaken very factual exam based kind of assessments. Um, so we introduced that to be able to give students um, a chance to do what we call a formative assessment. So it's really designed for them to get a feel for where they are, for them to get feedback on a piece of work that they submit. Um, it allows them to go through the submission processes, um, which can be complicated. So it's um, and Margaret and the material that we provide will help students go through that. But it is really useful to actually do it in a a, a situation that isn't for credit ultimately, but it's purely designed to get that um, experience of submitting and get that feedback. So students will meet with their advisor and go through um, the feedback that they've received from the advisor on that essay. Um, and a big thing we have is uh, three areas for students to focus on. Um, to help them further improve the work that they're submitting um, and that we've got a lot of positive feedback from students about that process so we have kept that uh, in this year um, and intend to <laughs> likely continue it in the future uh, so that's a, an important thing to highlight in first semester the other thing is that we expect students to start to do the process of identifying an area of research, ideally a research question, by looking at the literature and um, by looking at what supervisors are available and um, looking at gaps in the literature that they've read to be able to help support them develop a research question that they'll be able to take um, all the way through. And again, some programmes will just give you one semester to do that but we appreciate that it's a, a learning process throughout the whole of the MPH. So we support our students quite early on in starting that process, identifying a supervisor, um, and really by the end of semester one into the beginning of semester two, we would expect students to really have a, a good idea at that stage of what their research project will involve. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Kathy. There, there will also be as well as the college induction, um, we have our own programme induction, which will take place over the week before actual studies begin. Um, and that will be a mixture of live sessions and pre-recorded sessions. And that will basically be an introduction to the programme. Um, there will be a session on the initial programme essay a session on specialisms. So basically everything you need to know about the programme and how to take it forward, you'll be introduced to during that induction week. And indeed the um, information about the optional courses that students can then choose to take. Um, and that may be um, based on what specialism they want to do, um, but they'll have information there and they can start again thinking about that process and deciding what optional courses they want to do for semester two. So we have every, everyone following the same path in semester one um, and then some differences going into semester two depending on what students decide to do. Okay, brilliant. so just quickly I see that um, in the chat, Etinosa, um, you keep putting your hand up if you've got a question, put your question into the Q&A box for us and then we'll be able to answer what um, what uh, your question might be or, or what help you might need. Um, but just now I will just answer some of the questions that have actually come in the Q&A box. Um, so the first one then, how will the Public Health Programme at Glasgow equip students from LMICs to improve population health and health outcomes in these countries? So the mass, uh, it, quite a challenging question to start off with. <laughs> Um, but obviously, um, this is something that we feel very passionately about um, at the University of Glasgow and on the MPH programme. Um, so how do we do that? Well, it, it is about the knowledge and developing the skills that are fundamental to public health practice. Um, and having people like myself actively involved in it, and we have other 
NHS uh, collaborators involved in a program actually brings that experience um, into the actual academic arena. Um, so that's one area that is really useful. Um, but in terms of the knowledge, we'll cover essentially, you know, the full spectrum of what people will likely undertake as part of public health practice, whether that's in a, a low to middle in income country or whether that's in a high income country, the fundamentals will be covered as part of this course. However, there are opportunities though, um, where a, students from or students who want to practice in low to middle income countries can apply some of the learning. So an example will be um, in looking at surveillance systems. Uh, surveillance systems are, are how we can look at the patterns of health, how we can look at the patterns of disease. Um, and that could be whether it's um, you know, a chronic disease or whether that's an infectious disease. The principles are still the same and we can apply that to a lot of different healthcare systems across the world. Um, we have um, experience um, in that particular course, so communicable diseases where students can make comparisons, direct comparisons, for example, on uh, the course that I would usually uh, coordinate in the introduction to epidemiology, we also talk about uh, data sources. Um, and again, if we're looking at the patterns of, of health and health outcomes, um, we can look at the different data sources that are available to help us understand those patterns. And while we'll use examples from Scotland, because you know we do have access to essentially one of the, the best resources when it comes to health data. We'll use examples there. We, we will also be able to engage students to apply that to the uh, to different low to middle income countries as well. So there's a, a certain element of, well, this is how we might approach that. And I've seen former students who've um, you know, uh, been through the MPH at Glasgow applying that, for example, in uh, developing a cervical screening programme um, in a sub-Saharan African country um, and being able to look at the experience that we have, the kind of data sources that we collect, the kind of screening knowledge and skills that we develop in our students to then be able to apply that. And that was someone who worked in the Ministry of Health and was able to really steer that work forward. So that's just one example. There are many other examples I can give, but those the one is about communicable disease surveillance and the other one is about data sources and health data sources. Thanks, Kathy. Okay. Um, so how full on is this uh, next year going to be? Because someone's asking, um, Will there be time for a student to partake in a part-time job coupled with studies while in school, especially um, an, an immigrant student? Um, so what we would usually have um, is that we recommend that each student undertakes for each 20 credit course and all of our courses are 20 credit courses. We'd be expecting a student to undertake 200 hours um, of study associated with that course. Now that obviously includes things like um, the actual live sessions, the, um, the pre-recorded sessions, it'll involve assessment time, study time, practice time, etc. Absolutely, but that is the kind of level we expect. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing three courses in semester one as a full-time MPH student would do, then you can imagine that is a great deal of work. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> that being said, we do have students who have um, excellent time management skills, for example, or um, have support systems that allow them to be able to work part time. Um, so we do have students that will do that. Um, but obviously, it is that balance that, you know, work, study, life balance um, that's so important, not just for someone's studies, um, but also for their health and well-being. Um, so 
I, I know that's not a direct answer. I'll say it can be done, but it, it does have its challenges, is what I would say. Talking as someone who did work full time when I did the master's and quite a while ago now, well, 15 years ago now, um, and was able to work part time uh, during that. Uh, but it, it is challenging. It can be done. But... Brilliant. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Just a reminder, if you've got a question, please put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box. I'll get to you in a second, Claire, once we've um, answered these questions first. But just for, for everyone else, just remember to put your question in the Q&A box and it just keeps the chat box open for us to put in helpful links and stuff like that for you. Um, so I think this next question might be for Margaret or if you've got a link there, Margaret, maybe that you could pass on to people. What scholarships and funding are available for the MPH? Do you know of anything? I mean, basically, I would direct you to the MPH website and you will see at the bottom there is a link to, you know, scholarships and funding and also to the university database. Um, now, is that just the programme page? Yes, to the MPH programme page. Now, what I would say is obviously, you know, the likelihood is that all scholarships for this year have already been awarded because we do start in less than a month. Um, so it's, you know, scholarships are usually awarded quite well in advance of a programme start, but that's that's definitely the place um, to visit. You'll see a link to fees and funding, and if you go to that, you'll see at the bottom there's specific scholarships and then also a link to the general scholarship database for the university and if you put your program in it will bring up ones that are that our students are eligible for okay i've just popped those links in there for the person that's uh, just asked okay so moving on then um as you mentioned optional courses is there any plan for adding communicable diseases back to the program unfortunately not for not for this year we as Cathy, as the, that course is fully taught and led by staff from Health Protection Scotland. And at the moment, they're at the front line of the pandemic and are just unable to commit to offering that course. We will, we are happy to give students access to the materials from the previous year's course, but um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to for this coming academic year mm -hmm. offer that course. We have the uh, recordings included in that previous material as well, so uh, students may find that. There's audio recordings. Generally, when the lectures were given face to face, we audio recorded all lectures, um, and they will be available on the previous year's Moodle site, so students will have access to those and to presentations. Um, it is unfortunate, but it's um, and it just the circumstances do not allow that course to be offered this coming academic year. No the equivalent of the Public Health Scotland is the equivalent of the CDC, so Communicable Disease Control. Um, so if you've come across that, you'll see how important um, their role is uh, in the current pandemic. Um, however, what, what we are also doing is um, developing some material um, which is related to uh, the current COVID-19 uh, public health response. Um, and that will also be available for students to look at. Um, and we're integrating some of it into some of the other courses, for example, principles and public health. Um, so there will be material available, but the, it, it won't be possible to run it as um, a credit course, unfortunately. Okay. So I know throughout the university we're all, all the programmes are moving into a sort of online blended learning um, type. So what's that going to look like for public health? So in a public health, um, we feel very strongly that public health teaching can be um, delivered all online and indeed will be delivered all online for semester one. Um, however, what we do have is a combination of a pre-recorded material and live material and an example of the the live sessions 
um, that we'll have uh, is seminars. Uh, so there'll be questions posed in advance. Um, we can do group work through uh, Zoom and people may be familiar with the breakout rooms in Zoom. Um, so we can do smaller group work in that uh, as well. Um, we will have things like um, facilitated watching parties, I think is how we described it, um, for some of the pre-recorded materials. So there'll be someone available um, to do uh, questions and answers. There'll be regular questions and answer sessions, um, stroke seminar sessions uh, through certainly semester one. Um, in terms of, of semester two, we are planning to deliver that all online as well currently. Um, however, should uh, things change in um, unprecedented global pandemic, um, which allows us to be able to do face-to-face um, -face sessions, uh, whether that's as uh, very small groups, um, then we'll be taking that forward then. Um, the other thing is that uh, we would like at least to um, set up a, a few um, meet and greets, I think would be a way to describe it. Um, in an open area that's in front of our department. So it would be uh, outside um, where at least we, we could have a kind of um, more sort of, I don't want to say face to face because that's one of the criteria of a close contact. Um, so we wouldn't say face to face, but properly socially distanced environment where you can actually physically be there with the lecturers. So we do have uh, quite a lot of plans in place, um, but ultimately, obviously, the health and well-being and safety of both our staff and students is paramount. Okay, so basically the students will be able to have that opportunity to meet and discuss with the tutors um, any sort of queries or problems that they have. And I think the plan is also to have a weekly sort of drop-in session for students, um, just not about any particular course, just, you know, like a sort of once a week um, session where they can, you know, join if they want to, just ask any questions they have, or if they can't join and want to submit questions in advance, um, more of a welfare session rather than a kind of academic session. So we will have one of those uh, once a week. Mm -hmm. Okay, so somebody's asking, if we have already enrolled for a specialism subject now, can we change it later before the start of semester two or after the induction week? I'll let Margaret answer that one. If, so if, if, you've chose, if you're a full-time student and you've chosen your optional courses, um, you can uh, change those. And my experience is that the majority of full-time students will change at least one of their options and that's usually based on what they choose as their project mm -hmm. so they may choose a project that you know that indicates that there's a particular um there's a particular course that they have to take so that's it's easy um for full-time students to change their options if you're a part-time student you can still do that but it has to be done through me because if a part-time student changes their option, they will still be fee liable for their old course. So if any part-time students want to change their courses, it's not a problem, but they have to do it through me. Full-time students, you know, they can do it themselves, but I'm happy to do it for them. But I will send a reminder before the, the end of the semester one, you know, just to remind students that this is the cutoff point for uh, changing your options for semester two. Okay, that's great. So we've got 13 questions in at the moment and we're literally at the end of our 30 minutes. Are you ladies able to stay on for a little bit longer to be able to get these questions answered or do you need to shoot off? No, I can. No, I'm fine, yeah. Okay, okay. so um, everyone that's uh, all the attendees, if you can hold off just um, giving us any more questions right now because we've got 13 in at the moment. Some of the questions might actually already have been answered. If that is the case and maybe take your question off but if it's something that's really really important then we'll, we'll keep it on there for you and just try and get through everything so like I said just hold off and asking any more questions just now just so we can get through these for everyone that's asked um okay so will there be any placement programs where first timers can get first experience in public health practice um unfortunately it's it's not something that is uh, currently 
provided by the University of Glasgow. We have had some students um, who have been able to uh, arrange getting this kind of experience, um, usually after their uh, talk courses are over, or if it's been something to do with the um, project that they've decided to do. Um, so we have had some students have been able to arrange that and we do, you know, do our best to help students to do that too, but it isn't something we provide as part of the University of Glasgow, unfortunately. Um, and obviously in current circumstances, um, every single person who works in public health in Scotland, I could reliably say, um, are actively involved in the COVID-19 response. Mm -hmm. um, there is very little other public health going on at the moment. Okay. Um, okay, so for work and study, those of us from the EU, does the University of Glasgow help students to apply for national insurance or is it attributed automatically to students, Margaret? Would that be student services the person would have to go to? Student services? I mean, I think you can apply for an actually, it's not something that we we do as a, a department, but there is information on the, um, the student services website. If you can't find it, if you contact me directly, and I'm help, I'll be happy to point you in the direction of that. But um, yeah, it, it's not something that we would do, but it is something that a student can apply for. Okay, well, I've just put the link for the FEQs there. So click on that um, and see if there's any more information on there. You should hopefully um, find a link through that because we've thought about, I think, every question that we could possibly think of for the FEQs there. Um, let's see. Can we do specialisations in two subjects, for example, epidemiology and health economics? No, <laughs> because your your research project has got to fit into your specialisation. So as well as your uh, your core course for the specialisation, so for example, if you're doing epidemiology, as well as the general MPH core courses, you also have to do advanced epidemiology and you have your project has to fit into that specialisation. So it wouldn't be possible to do two specialisations. Okay. Um, so we have new threats to global health, such as Ebola and COVID-19, amongst others. Will this influence the delivery of the public health programme at Glasgow going forward, do you think? It, it, the MPH at Glasgow has always had, um, at its heart, um, health inequalities. And that's something that, um, you know, is it, it's particularly important um, for you know, globally, but also particularly important in Scotland um, when it comes to socioeconomic inequalities. Um, we also have um, a programme that's really embedded within the social determinants of health. Um, and therefore, we've tended to have much more focus um, on that health improvement um, elements of it of um, public health, I would say. Um, we've always had a communicable disease course, um, as certainly as far as I've, as long as I've been involved, and um, Margaret can correct me if it was something else before that. Um, however, it's not been a particular focus of the overall programme. Um, and one could say that we should, uh, as a programme, reconsider that, uh, given current circumstances and how that's likely to continue. Um, this is, um, for a generation, been the biggest public health challenge uh, that we've certainly ever faced. Um, so it is a, a really good point in terms of going forward. We do have a One Health programme, which is particularly focused on um, infectious diseases that go from animals to humans and impact on human health. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something that the university as a whole um, does cover. Um, we do have, uh, just to answer the bit about global health, um, we really do have a strong a global element to our program though in terms of a globalization in health 
is something that's say covered by one of our colleagues um, our lecturer uh, Jackie Riley leads that um, and where she particularly looks at um, health inequalities globally and um, so certainly global health I think we're very strong in that mm -hmm. um, but as a programme our focus hasn't tended to be on communicable diseases so much. Okay so are our diplomas the same no matter what specialism we choose? No, if you choose to get, if you choose a specialism, that will appear on your degree certificate. Um, so it would basically, if you chose again epidemiology, it would say Master of Public Health uh, with epidemiology specialism. Um, now, what happens? I mean, this year there was quite a number of students undertook a specialism. So before the degrees were awarded, I did contact them in advance just to double check that they still wanted that specialism on their um, degree certificate. So obviously I would do that again next year. But yes, if you choose a specialism, it will appear on your part, your degree parchment. Okay. Is previous knowledge in maths and statistics essential in order to study data science specialism? Put a lot of S's on that. <laughs> um, it, it isn't um, required. However, certainly um, rapidly developing the skills, um, the knowledge and skills associated with uh, statistics is very useful if you're going to do data science. However, we have um, an introduction to statistics course. And if you're doing data science, we have um, optional courses, obviously, that people need to, to cover. But we do have um, further epidemiology and statistics, for example, that can be particularly useful. Um, and that takes people e even further forward in their statistics. Um, in terms of um, where you start, I think it's the area I would say that our students are most concerned about when they start. Um, and it, it's an area that we very much focus on because we understand that our students are concerned about it. Um, the course itself, that introduction to statistics course, takes people all, all the way from understanding what you know the categories of data are, the types of data that might be used, um, all the way up to understanding about um, how one thing is correlated to another. Um, and actually it, it takes people in a slow, steady way building on what they've done before, again, to help people build up the confidence when it comes to statistics. Um, there are things that, that you can do um, as well in terms of just revising your maths skills. And that's really, uh, to be honest, simple arithmetic skills um, predominantly is very useful at the beginning. Um, it, but we do provide material to help students do that as well. But I'd say it's the area they're most concerned about. But we take it slowly, we build on their learning um, and it, you know, it, students definitely benefit from that and understand statistics a huge amount more than they did when they started. Okay. Uh, let's see. Are you guys going to have any welcome Zoom sessions? This should be an induction session. It is. Uh, um, I did send students a welcome email last week. Um, so all students who have accepted their offers um, would have got that email and there was a, an induction timetable attached to that. So that First, the welcome the, the welcome session on Monday, the 2nd of October, will be a live session. Um, and we'll just talk you through the programme. Um, and then during the course of that week, there will be various sessions, some live and some pre-recorded. Okay. So I'm going to get back to Claire McDonald's question in the Zoom webinar chat, because we've only got a few minutes left. Then if we just take this up to 12.15, um, Claire's asking, can you give some examples of the types of projects students in the past have done? Um, yeah. 
trying to Margaret to I'm just going to have a look and see if I can bring up the list from uh, last year we can provide aim um, with examples um our students do a number of different types of projects um so the first one is that they may decide to do um, and I'll talk generally and then come back and, and talk more about what's happened recently. Um, but typically our students decide to do um, primary research and that primary research means that essentially they're collecting data for research purposes. Um, so that may be in a questionnaire and um, it may be in a qualitative way. So um, focus groups, semi-structured interviews, things like that. Um, so some students choose to do primary research. Secondary research is quite common, um, and that's where we use um, data that's routinely collected. And we've had students who've used census data, who've used um, large survey data, who've used something, some of the big cohort studies that are available. Um, an example is the UK Biobank. That's a, a you know over a million people uh, registered and um, were recruited and included in this particular cohort. Um, it's a cohort and it follows up those uh, people over time. They coll collected a huge amount of data. They did um, different types of analysis. They did different things like blood tests. They did. For some of the groups, they've done um, x-ray exams, they've done advanced testing, they've done MRIs as well, uh, all sorts of different things that are available. So we've had quite a lot of students who've used that as a source of data, so a secondary data. And um, quite commonly, our students will undertake a supported systematic review. Um, and a systematic review is, like it sounds, a way of systematically searching the literature, identifying relevant uh, uh, research that's already been published to be able to help answer a question. And some may pull the results of that into what we call a meta-analysis. So those are typical types of projects. However, it wasn't always possible through this year for students to be able to, who had planned but not yet started to collect primary data. Um, for example, it wasn't possible during our COVID lockdown to undertake um, interviews or focus groups. Um, so quite a lot of our students did change to do more of a systematic review process. Um, but secondary data is there. It's easy to access. Um, so those kind of students were able to continue and do the projects that they originally um, set out to do. Um, so yeah, you've got some examples of titles that are um, being put into the chat um, by Margaret. And um, you've got quite a bit of, you know, there's qualitative, as you see, there's that UK Biobank um, using it. Um, and then you've got an example of a systematic review as well that was undertaken. So hopefully that helps answer the, the question, how possible it would be to collect primary data in um, online questionnaires can still be done. Um, there are techniques to doing online interviews and focus groups. Um, they can be used, they are challenging, um, but it is the kind of thing that we're all gonna have to negotiate going forward in this, um, the, the you know current COVID-19 restrictions that we have. Okay, so I think we'll have to call it a day there just now. I know there's about eight questions sitting in there that we just, we don't have time to get around to. If um, the question is there, then um, by all means. I... Could, could I just maybe quickly answer? Uh -huh, yeah. The last few, if that. Yeah, if, if you want to. It's just, I just, uh, I don't know what sort of time you guys have either, because obviously we would set this up for 30 minutes, but if there's ones there that you want to um, read out first and then answer so that, you know, people who are, are re watching what this, yeah. they have just that, then by all means. Can quickly answer, can we choose more than three optional courses in semester one? Uh, you can't do it, there's no optional courses in semester one, everything in semester one is core. Um, optional courses are in semester two and 
There's one online, one in the summer semester. You can only choose three as credit courses, but we do allow students access to, we call it auditing or sitting in. You know, usually we recommend just one other course and it may be a course you're really interested in, but you don't want to take as a credit. So you would attend the course, have access to the materials, but you wouldn't undertake the assessment. Um, and it, quickly, it's IELTS and compulsory for admission to the Master of Public Health. Um, yeah, I mean, for all programmes at the University of Glasgow, it's not always IELTS, but, you know, you do have to achieve a certain standard of English. And information about that is on the, the MPH webpage that Michelle's already posted the, the link to. I think it also depends as well, even though the person studied dentistry and studied in English, I think it depends where. It does. It's, having studied in English does not guarantee you um, a waiver. Um, in fact, there's very few waivers to the English uh, language requirement, but it is on the web page. Um, another quick one, if we defer to next year, is the admit confirmed all my um, application undergo admission process again. Um, that you have to apply for a deferral and it's, I have to say this year, it will, it's not an automatic thing. Um, so it, it that, that goes to admissions and basically it will be, it will depend on how many deferrals have already been um, offered. Normally under normal circumstances, you wouldn't have to reapply. If a deferral is given, then your place would just automatically be transferred to the next academic year. Okay, is there anything else that you'd like to answer? Um, uh, there's just another question about communicable disease or a couple of questions. Um, yes, I said lecture material from last year will be available um, for uh, communicable diseases if people are interested in looking at. Is there an optional module that you would recommend to take instead? Um, I, it, it's... Um, so again, our communicable diseases is an optional module already, um, but it, it, we don't really have a, an equivalent. It would be a case. Yes, it's not, uh, and I don't, I don't think there is an equivalent in the university. Um, so globalisation will cover some of the things I'd mentioned before. Um, we've also got in, uh, environment, sustainability and health. Um, which uh, they will cover uh, antimicrobial resistance as part of that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any of the others. A um, little bit on uh, health. Promotion. There's one here about we can find many courses online. Does it mean in China we can start to watch the recording any time we want rather than stay up late? Obviously, you know, we have timetabled the, the classes exactly as we would have timetabled for on campus. So um, obviously if a 10 o'clock in the morning start for you is like in the middle of the night, then we wouldn't expect you to do that. But what we would recommend is that you set aside a specific time for that slot each week for your own time management so that you know that a specific time, that's when I have to work on principles or I have to work on epidemiology. Um, if you can attend the live sessions, that's fine. If not, they will all be available as recordings. Um, but we do understand that, you know, it's just not possible to get a slot that is going to be suitable for everybody for live sessions. So um, if you can attend, that's fine. If you can't, it will be available as a recording. Okay, um, this one I'd like to read out because it's uh, quite a few people have asked with regards to it. Will there be any changes made to tuition fees, particularly for self-funded students? I'm afraid not. Across the board, the effort and work that the administrators and the programme directors and lecturers are putting into this or putting into their online programmes now or blended learning programmes is just the same as what they would do if you were to be here on campus. So there's not going to be any reduction in fees for that, Mark Eden, sorry. I just see there's a last one about dissertations. What we do is we, we will produce by the end of the year a list of project supervisors and the kind of area that they can offer supervision in. And then it's up to students to contact those supervisors and develop a project topic with them. It also asks about exams. Now, normally there would be exams, but there would be next year. 
So the three normal delivery exams for principles of public health, epidemiology and statistics, but there will be no exams next year. So all assessments will be some form of coursework. Okay. All righty. I think, is there anything else you want to quickly answer there? Or um, I can cover it. So does the scope of health economics include behavioural economics? Um, not in the MPH, um, the health economics that um, is included it is really what I would say is an introduction to health economics. Um, it isn't the focus of our MPH uh, either, but the course does cover things like supply, needs, demand, etc. So there's a little bit of behaviour in there, the different influences um, on supply and demand. Um, if someone wants, to, if someone wants to do the specialism, then um, a they they can also access some of the other courses as sitting in if they want that health or health economics and technology assessment team uh, deliver. But also, if that's something they're interested in looking at, and um, then they can they can uh, seek a supervisor from the health economics team, um, to be able to look at that maybe as a as a project. Um, so that should cover the hill. So uh, what about, will we have short term internships? Um, no, we don't have that associated with the MPH at the University of Glasgow. Um, oh, there was uh, one there about health informatics. Um, so health informatics is all about the, it, it, what was the, the question about health, health informatics again? Uh... Because that's slightly different, unless they mean health economics. Can I just quickly answer that question? It says, when will we be able to start choosing our modules? I did send a welcome email to all students who had accepted an offer last week, and there was information on that about, you know, choosing your courses and registering. Um, so you should have received that on Wednesday or Thursday of last week. If you haven't or you can't find it, if you want to contact me directly, then I can forward it on to you again. Um, but as I say, that was sent to all students who had accepted an offer uh, last week. So I'm not seeing any question on health informatics unless, so if the person, if, I, if someone, one of you has sent in a, a question that we've missed here, that's for uh, regarding health informatics, please just email us in. You can hit reply to the email I sent you, the invitation one, or you should be able to get in contact with Margaret via the general email um, on the, the public health webpage, which the link I've put up in the Zoom webinar chat. Um, so just, uh, so you've answered the one about choosing modules. Um, I think that's us for just now. Like I said, everyone, if you've got a question that maybe we've missed or you think maybe has been a bit silly that you don't want to ask in public, just email us. No, no question is too silly for us to answer for you. And I hope this has been this has been of help for you. I know it was last minute. Thank you all for showing up. Um, so thank you, for, uh, Margaret. Thank and you. Kathy. I'm looking forward to meeting you all, even via Zoom in early November. Yes, yes. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put some more links up in the chat box for you all. Just so you've got that there and um, you will have access tomorrow to this recording. So if you wait till tomorrow, don't email me today so you can't get access to it. Wait till tomorrow. Um, you should be able to access all this information for you as well as everything. It's travelling to Glasgow, starting your programme, applications and deferrals, your CAS acceptance of studies, um, EU settlement schemes, the session dates, your FAQs, everything's there for you, um, just so that you've got access to it as well. Just um, All right, well, thank you very much, everyone, and um, take care, enjoy your day, enjoy your morning, your evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Cathy, and thank you, Margaret. Okay, bye. Take care, bye. Bye.